Welcome to Rosedale Community Church. So glad you can join us today for our service online. We are continuing our series on the Lord's Prayer and our speaker today is Simon Allaby with a message on Thy Kingdom Come. Good to speak here, which was for the, um, uh, the Young at Heart group, which when I came it was the over 60s. And um, I remember and I, and I spoke my heart out and then um, somebody woke up at the end <laughs> and, uh, and, and said, and said how disappointed they were to have missed it. So, um, so, but that was kind of, that was an after lunch, that was kind of the graveyard shift. So I'm hoping that uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, you'll, all be, you'll all be awake. So it wasn't Sheila, I got to say it wasn't Sheila. So, so there we go. But uh, I should try and keep you awake this morning. And uh, I'm going to read from Luke chapter 17 with the last... Um, well, about the last decade, it feels, we've been uh, preaching through Luke's Gospel at uh, Bolney Chapel, and uh, we, we've, uh, we had a little break in the Advent, but we've resumed uh, preaching through Luke. So where we got to last Sunday was Luke chapter 17, verses 20 to 37. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to warm that up and uh, give it to you this morning. But it'll be fresh under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, so uh, there'll be different things to say. But if, you want, if you've got a Bible, if you want to turn to Luke chapter 17... Uh, I'm going to read from verse 20 to the, um, to the end of the chapter, and uh, it may in your Bible, as it does in mine, have the title, The Coming of the Kingdom of God. Uh, once, having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to his disciples, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Don't go running off after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulphur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord, they asked. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Let's pray for a moment before we unpack God's word. Father, thank you for your living words to us this morning, living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. Uh, Lord, may our hearts and minds be open and attentive to you. Uh, may it be your voice that we hear. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, um, uh, just the context of this passage, Jesus has been on his final journey to Jerusalem since chapter 9, verse 51. So everything that happens after chapter 9, verse 51 is Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem. In that verse, uh, we read that, um, that Jesus set his face for Jerusalem. And everything that's sort of happened since chapter 9, verse 51 is uh, Jesus educating his disciples, teaching them, preparing them for what is to come? And that's the context of this passage. And uh, Jesus has been asked this question about the kingdom of God. And their expectation is that uh, the kingdom of God is, is, is going to come in um, sort of unmistakably. When the kingdom of God arrives, uh, you won't be able to miss it. Uh, I don't know if you remember back to the days of the, uh, the first Gulf War. Uh, the military strategy that was adopted by the Americans and their allies in the first Gulf War was shock and awe. 
uh, it was just overwhelming force uh, to so overwhelm the enemy that they would be so stunned that it would be easy just to march in and establish your victory. And that was the strategy, shock and awe. And the Pharisees kind of have this idea about the day of the Lord, that uh, the day of the Lord is going to come and it will be kind of shock and awe. God will intervene so decisively in world history and so decisively on their behalf that their enemies will simply fall away. The Gentile nations that have been oppressing them for generations will be utterly defeated and the new Israel will be established. And that's their understanding, that's their expectation. That's why they don't get Jesus, because he doesn't look anything like they were expecting the Messiah to be. And so they ask this question, uh, when will the kingdom of God come? And Jesus replies, the kingdom of God doesn't come with your careful observation. Uh, the word that's used is the word that's used of a doctor looking at a patient waiting for symptoms to appear. Uh, uh, he's kind of looking, waiting to see it come. And Jesus says, no, uh, people won't say here it is or there it is. Because the kingdom of God is within you. Now, you may have a footnote in your, in your Bible because this word is very difficult to translate. And so various different translations are given. Uh, in my New International Version, it says, because the kingdom of God is within you. Uh, but then there's a footnote that says, well, it might be the kingdom of God is among you, which means something different. And there, there are different ways of, of addressing this word. And whichever way you, uh, it kind of, they all work. They all work, but they all give us a slightly different spin on what Jesus actually means. So it might be that Jesus is saying, well, the kingdom of God is among you. And if Jesus says, well, the kingdom of God is among you, then it's really referencing himself. Because who is among them? Well, it's, it's Jesus himself. And what is the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God is the place where, G where God's rule and reign is fully established. The kingdom of God is the place where God is in charge. And everything works as God intended it to. And when we look at the life of Jesus, uh, well, what do we see? We see the kingdom of God in completeness. In Jesus' life, the rule and reign of God is there. That's why people are so drawn to him, because they see something like they've never seen before. They, they see that he speaks with authority. He heals the sick. He casts out demons. He welcomes the lepers and the prostitutes and the outcasts in the kingdom of God is embodied in Jesus' life. That's why the writer to the Hebrews uh, says that uh, 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 we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. In Jesus, the kingdom of God is, is embodied. So maybe Jesus is saying, well, the kingdom of God is, is among you. Look at me and you see the kingdom of God. But it might be that Jesus is saying... The kingdom of God is within you because, as Jesus has told us before, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's so small, you can barely see it with the naked eye, but it grows and becomes a tree in which the birds can make their home. Uh, the kingdom of God begins with this tiny baby born in Bethlehem. The kingdom of God begins with 12 disciples, 12 apostles who are not much to look at. Uh, they're disorganised, they're, they're, they're disunited, they're ill-equipped, they're a ragtag bunch of people. But the kingdom of God grows. The kingdom of God is within us. The kingdom of God is within us because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The promise of Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 24. Uh, God says, uh, I'll sprinkle clean water on you. I'll cleanse you from all your impurities. Verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That's the promise of God in the Old Testament. The promise of God that is fulfilled uh, on the day of Pentecost. In a very real sense, the kingdom of God is within us. Wherever we go... We carry the kingdom of God with us. I was having a, a chat with a friend last week and we were, just, uh, we were talking about the promise that Jesus makes that uh, where two or three are gathered together, uh, Jesus is present with them. And sometimes we use it in the context of, uh, well, we're feeling a bit despondent because literally there are only two or three of us gathered together. And we're like, well, we'll be all right because where two or three are gathered together. Uh, and, and we use it as a kind of comfort against absence because there aren't very many of us gathered together. But actually, the power of the verse is about presence. Because where two or three are gathered together, 
God is present. So where two or three of us are in the supermarket, God is present. Where two or three of us are in our place of work, God is present. Jesus is present. The kingdom of God is within us. It's amongst us. Uh, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, one of the foremost New Testament scholars in the world alive today, in his translation, uh, he says a, a better way of translating it is the kingdom of God is within your grasp. The kingdom of God is within your grasp. Because he says, actually, the, the strength of the, of the word is you've got to do something about it. The kingdom of God is within your grasp, but are you going to grasp it and are you going to do something about it? It's more active. When you think, well, the kingdom of God is among us, it's kind of a bit passive because it's like, oh, yeah, it's among us. That's lovely. Or the kingdom of God is within you. Well, that's lovely. It's like ready break. Uh, you, know, you, just, you, know, you have it in the morning and then you have, kind of have this glow. You have this sort of glow for the rest of the day. You don't actually do no, need to do much about it. You just eat your ready break and then you glow. Uh, it's a passive thing. He says, no, this is, it's an active thing. You've got to be actively involved in the kingdom of God. And the rest of the passage bears that out. The kingdom of God is within your grasp. But are you going to grasp it? And are you going to do something about it? Are you going to be actively involved in the kingdom of God? So Jesus begins to address the Pharisees' question. He says, no, it's not going to, it's not going to be shock and awe. It's not going to be like that. He's, and then he talks to his disciples. He says, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man but you will not see it. People will tell you, there he is, here he is. Don't go running off after them. Uh, the, the Old Testament expectation, I say, was this, you know, for, for a decisive day, the day of the Lord, the day when God would intervene decisively in history. That's what they're longing for. And it's interesting that he says, um, uh, the days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. You will long to see. Now, why would you long for the days of the Son of Man. Why would you long for God to intervene? Would you long for God to intervene because everything is going well? Uh, Because the world is becoming more and more peaceful. Uh, Because uh, people are living more and more together and there's more and more justice and there's more and more equality and and everything is getting better and better and better. So I'm going to long for God to intervene. No, complete reverse. Uh, We long for God to intervene because things are are not going well, because things are not getting more peaceful. Uh, uh, So Jesus is saying, look, you know, days are coming when you will long for one of the days of the Son of Man. So he's saying things are going to get worse. Things are not going to get better in the world. Things are not going to get better in world history. Things are going to get worse. Uh, You don't call the police when there's no trouble. You dial 999 when there's an emergency. You cry out for God to intervene when things are bad and getting worse. And he says that's what it's going to be like. But, he says, be careful. The danger is that when things are so bad and we so long for God to intervene, we see his intervention where it isn't actually. Uh, I remember when I was at, um, I was at Durham University, in, Durham, there's only one, Durham University in the 80s, 1980s, and I didn't quite realise it at the time, but I was there, there was a season of revival in Durham that began in the sort of late 1960s and carried on through to the mid-1980s. There was an extraordinary move of God's spirit and uh, just extraordinary revival. When I was there, the, the Christian Union was hundreds strong. There were hundreds of students came to faith, the churches were growing, uh, there was a, a new church, you know, it was an amazing season of revival. And... Um, I don't know if it was apocryphal, but when I was there in the mid-80s, I was told that there was such an expectation of Jesus' imminent return that some students hadn't sat their finals papers because they had become so convinced that Jesus was about to return, they thought, what's the point? And the story went that they'd gone in to sit their finals papers and had just written Emmanuel and sadly hadn't written anything else because... Uh, Jesus didn't turn up as quickly as they were anticipating and uh, I'm not quite sure what happened to them. But there is that danger that sometimes we so long for God to intervene. We look at our world, we so long that we, we kind of end up down a rabbit hole and we get distracted. We think, oh, God, is, this is it. Well, he says, no, he says, when the Son of Man comes back, you won't be able to miss it because it'll be like lightning that flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. So he's saying, look, yes, the Son of Man is coming. 
Jesus is going to return. But when he returns, you won't be able to miss it. Verse 25, first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. On this journey to Jerusalem, one of the things that Jesus has been trying to get across to his disciples is that he's going to die. And they, they, just don't, they just don't have a frame of reference to put that into. They just miss it completely, which is why they're so devastated on Good Friday. Because despite the fact he's tried to tell them, they just don't understand it. But again, here, he's trying to tell them, first, he must suffer many things. Jesus comes twice. The first time Jesus came, he came to suffer and to die. He was going to Jerusalem to die on a cross. And he went to that cross to die in our place, to die for our sins. In order that when he comes the second time to judge, that judgment won't fall on us. Because that judgment fell on him on the cross. He came the first time to suffer and to die. He comes the second time to judge and to restore. And in order to avoid that judgment, in order to survive that judgment, as we're about to see, we must choose Christ. We must choose to uh, repent. We must choose to put our sin on the cross with him and accept the price that he paid. Verse 26, Jesus is very stark in what he says, just as it was in the days of Noah. He's talking about what's going to happen in the future. And he says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day Lot left for Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Jesus says, just as it was, just as it was, this is going to happen again. Uh, Jesus is saying two things. He's saying, look, judgment is coming and not everyone, else, not everyone is going to survive. Judgment is coming, not everyone is going to survive. It's, it's, these are messages about judgment, but they're also messages about mercy and redemption. Because why did God tell Noah to build an ark? Because he's a God of mercy and a God of redemption. And he's a God who provides a way of salvation. Uh, in, the days of, in the days of Lot, uh, you can read this in um, Genesis chapter 18 and 19, but um, uh, uh, Abraham has a meeting with God. He has, it's called a theophany. There are various theophanies in the Old Testament where the Trinity appear to an individual. And Abraham has this meeting with, with the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, has this theophany and, and, uh, and God shares his heart with Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, look, these cities are so wicked they're so wicked, my, my judgment is going to fall and I'm going to destroy them. And, uh, and Abraham pipes up and says, well, what if, hang on a minute. Uh, I, love, I love the way that, you know, you're able to have these sort of discussions with the Lord. He says, well, hang on a minute. What if there are 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom? You can't, you know, you can't kill 50 righteous people. Just, and, and so God says, oh, well, yeah, no, no, if there are 50 righteous, so it'll be all right. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll save them. And then Abraham goes, oh, well, what if there are only 40? And have another little chat and go, yeah, all right, if there's 40, and then it goes, well, about 30. And uh, I, I just kind of picture God starting to roll his eyes at this point. Like, yeah, all right, if there are 30, <laughs> oh, yeah, and, then, and then Abraham's going, well, well, about 20. And, all right, yeah, 20. And then they get down to 10, and he's like, what if there are only 10? And he's like, yeah, all right, there's 10, fine. So, so God sends two angels into, into Sodom to Lot's family uh, to warn them and to say, look, God's judgment is about to fall on this city Get out now. Take your family and get out now. Because Lot's family is the only righteous family in the city. Do you know what the, the, heart, the heartbreaking thing about this situation is that Lot tells his family. He tells his sons-in-law. And his sons-in-law think he's joking. Mm -hmm. When you read it in uh, Genesis 18, 19, he tells his son, his sons-in-law thought he was joking. And they stay behind. Mm -hmm. And they die they think he's joking and uh, it's not a joke God's judgment does fall and it's not a joke and Jesus is saying just as it was in these days it's going to happen again and the reality is our world will be completely unprepared for the return of Christ people are eating drinking marrying being given in marriage eating drinking buying and selling planting a building when Jesus returns Jesus is saying 
most of the world will be taken completely by surprise. Because our world, our culture has no expectation of this. And when we preach a message, when we preach this message, when we say, look, look guys, you've got to wake up and smell the coffee, there is a judgment coming, people think we're joking. You know, we, when we tell people there's a heaven and there's a hell, and you're going to end up in one or the other, and Jesus came 2,000 years ago to die on a cross so that you could be certain of going to heaven, people think we're joking. People think we're joking, and so, and so we lose confidence and we don't preach that message. Church doesn't preach a message anymore of heaven and hell. Uh, you know, back in the day, you know, fire and brimstone. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the, um, I just went to see the film Belfast on um, Friday night, it's a new Kenneth Branagh film. Wonderful film, do you? Most people are going to see it. But there's one bit in the film where he goes to, he's like a 10-year-old child, and he goes to, you know, to church. And you can imagine Northern Ireland in the late 1960s, the Presbyterians, they didn't mince their words. You know, he, he like gets both barrels about heaven and hell. <laughs> poor, poor kid's terrified. But, you know, we don't want to scare people into the kingdom of God. But the reality is, judgment is, is going to come and people think we're joking. So we don't, we don't say it. We've, we've kind of softened the gospel. Uh, and the gospel that we preach now so often is, it's a more comfortable gospel. It's, it's God loves you. That's a nice message, isn't it? You know, who, who's going to object to that? I mean, the atheists object. But generally, you know, God loves you. Ah, oh, that's nice. Come as you are. Stay as you are. God loves you. It's not the gospel. The gospel is you're utterly lost. You're utterly lost. You're destined for a lost eternity. But God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus. And his son Jesus, Jesus willingly went and died on a cross because God loves you and because he doesn't want you to live under condemnation. He, does, he wants you to avoid God's just wrath. Yes, God does love you. Come as you are, but then repent and let him heal you and transform you and change you into the person you were always created to be. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who's on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Remember what happens to, to Lot's wife. Lot takes his wife and his daughters, his <laughs> stupid sons-in-law, stay behind. But the rest of the family, they're on the way, and Lot's wife looks back. She looks back. She doesn't really want to leave. She, she's still kind of captivated by that life that actually she's got to break free from and leave behind. And because she's half-hearted about her leaving, she ends up losing her life. There's a message in here about our wholehearted devotion to following Jesus. Are we wholeheartedly devoted to following Jesus, to leaving behind the old way of life, to leaving behind the sins of the old way of life? Are we, are we so devoted to Jesus that we're fully focused on him and we're willing to leave behind that, the old life that we used to live. Uh, you'll be familiar, I'm sure, with um, Jesus' words in, uh, to the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. It has this lovely verse in it, doesn't it, um, that we know so well, 3.20. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them. And they with me. We use it, and evangelists use it all the time. It's a wonderful verse for evangelism. It's got nothing to do with evangelism. I mean, it works, which is why we use it, because it's a great verse. It's got literally nothing to do with evangelism. Uh, Jesus is talking to this church and saying, you're so lukewarm, you make me want to throw up. That's when Jesus is talking to Christians. He's saying, look, you're so lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold. He says, I wish you were one or the other, but because you're neither one, you're neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. God loves us, doesn't he? <laughs> he says, you make me puke. He says, I tell them, don't realize, you think you're rich, but actually you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. You know, Jesus, you know, he always kind of cuts to the chase. You know, imagine if he was, you know, what would he say to us this morning? How would he, he sees our hearts, the reality of, of how we are. And it's because he loves us that he points these things out. So Jesus is saying to this church, who are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked, I'm knocking on the door. 
will you let me in? Amazing, is it, that, that Jesus says to Christians, to disciples, to those who know him and love him and who've chosen to follow him, he says, knock, knock, you need to let me in. Knock, knock, you need to let me in. You're half-hearted, you're lukewarm, your love for me is, is half-hearted. Jesus wants us to be whole-hearted. Are we whole-hearted for Jesus this morning? Is Jesus knocking on the door of our hearts this morning and saying, look, why are you still, why are you still doing that stuff? Why are you still watching that stuff? Why are you still entertaining those thoughts? Why are you still happy that you have these patterns of behaviour that you know are wrong? Why do you keep losing your temper? Why are you so irritable? Why won't you let me in and let me heal you and restore you? Why are you putting up with a broken life that I actually came to heal? Why are you still carrying these wounds that beset you and trip you up and and mean that you're not living the life that I want you to live? Knock, knock. Will you let me in? Will you let me in to eat with you? I know you're scared. I know you're afraid of what it would mean if you allowed me to touch that part of your life and bring healing and restoration. I know you're scared about what that might mean for how your life might Look, I know that those things bring you comfort and you're worried about, well, what will happen if I give that stuff up? Knock, knock. Let me in. Let me eat with you. It's this beautiful picture of Middle Eastern intimacy. That if someone knocks on your door, you let them in and you give them hospitality. And Jesus says, let me in. Let me in. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. It's the topsy-turvy kingdom of God. Uh, You get what you give up. You get back what you sacrifice. Jesus says, look, the day is coming when there will be this separation. One will be taken and one will be left because when judgment comes, there is a separation. Separation between those who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ and those who don't because on that day of judgment the only answer to the question why should I let you into my heaven is because of Jesus because of his sacrifice on the cross that's the only thing I have to bring is Jesus's sacrifice where Lord they asked where there is a dead body there the vultures will gather Isn't that a great little great little saying what on earth does it mean the uh, when you read the, when you read the commentaries the the, the uh, the kind of the interpretations of what this means, then I mean, the, it was as long as your arm. There are so many different ways of working out well what's the dead body and where do the vultures gather. Simplest way to understand it is is when the time is right. I think when the time is right, Jesus will come back. When the time is right, there will be a judgment. And the, I guess the question is, will we be ready? Will we be ready? Will when Jesus returns, will he find us? passionately serving him, passionately proclaiming the gospel, faithfully proclaiming the gospel, the whole gospel, not just that God loves you, but that God loves you so much he wants to rescue you from sin because sin is cutting you off from him. And if that is not dealt with, that will be your situation for eternity. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross. He's coming back to bring judgment. He's coming back to restore. He's coming back to recreate. Will we be ready? Will we be ready? He's knocking on the door, knock, knock. Will you let me in? Will you let him in this morning? Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you you love us so much that you're willing to speak truth. You speak truth that even when it caused offence, even when people didn't understand, uh, you spoke truth because it was the truth, not because it was palatable or comfortable or acceptable but because it was the truth that you came the first time to suffer and die so that we might live forever and you're coming back to judge this world to remove from it all the wickedness and unrighteousness and Lord Jesus I want to pray this morning I want to pray firstly maybe for for any of us who may not have taken that step of confessing our sins may not yet have taken that step of repenting and surrendering our lives to you, giving up our lives so that we might live. 
uh, just even in these moments we pray father thank you that you thank you that you you love me so much that you sent your son jesus to die for me that on the cross he paid the price for my sin and wrongdoing and even this morning jesus i say sorry sorry for the mess that i've made things that i've thought and said and done would you forgive me Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live the rest of my life for you? I ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for the forgiveness you bring. Maybe this morning you can pray that prayer in your heart and know that if you were to die today, you would go to be with Jesus in heaven. And then I want to pray for Maybe for those of us who know the Lord Jesus, but he's, he's knocking. He's knocking, he's saying, look, I behold, I stand at the door and knock. Will you open the door and let me in? And let me heal you, let me restore you, let me give you the gifts that I want you to use for my glory. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Be willing to become that living sacrifice. Don't be lukewarm. Be wholehearted. And Lord Jesus, I pray for uh, this church at at Rosedale this morning. Uh, Lord, again, we do lift uh, Bethany and the family to you this morning and pray that you come in your comfort and your love and uh, just bless them. Hold them in your arms this morning. Carry them through this season of grief. But Lord, thank you for the purposes that you have for this church in this place. To be a sanctuary where people can come and find healing and salvation. And I pray for a fresh spirit of boldness. An anointing of boldness to preach the whole gospel of Christ. And to see your kingdom come. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.